these photographs uh, produced. Um, so the biosphere was scientifically Americanized, forgive the pun. Uh, the Scientific American devoted its September 1970 issue and a follow-up book uh, to the biosphere. The editor's forward begins with these words, photographs of the earth as the sort of key moment there, thus implicitly acknowledging the debt owed by the biosphere to NASA. Hutchinson wrote the synoptic introductory article, credited both Seuss as inventor and Vernadsky as transformer of the concept, and asserted, quote, it is essentially Vernadsky's concept of the biosphere that we accept today. But that is hardly the biosphere that he described as the article proceeded, which was almost purely in ecosystemic terms, focusing on photosynthesis, trophic relationships, and material cycling. Hutchinson does feature the biogenesis of oxygen in the atmosphere, but not the biogenesis of the chemistry of the hydrosphere and the crustal lithosphere. So though by the time it, the biosphere concept is revived and Americanized, uh, many of the uh, most interesting uh, and profound features of Bernatsky's concept uh, began to be uh, lost. Uh, with environmental crisis Jeremiah's in full throat by 1970, Hutchinson went out of his way to contrast his technological pessimism with Bernatsky's technological optimism. Hutchinson quotes a letter from Vernadsky in 1945, written only months before his death, in which he writes, I look forward with great optimism. I think that we undergo not only a historical, but a planetary change as well. We live in a transition to the noosphere. Hutchinson explains that by noosphere, Vernadsky meant the envelope of mind that was to supersede the biosphere, the envelope of life, and thus he seems to conflate Vernadsky's noosphere with Teilhard's, unfortunately. And then he goes on, he says, unfortunately, the quarter century since those words were written has shown how mindless most of the changes wrought by man on the biosphere have been. So, turning now to the advent of the Gaia hypothesis, by his own account, Lovelock first uh, put forward the Gaia hypothesis at a scientific meeting in 1969, and it was there he met Lynn Margulis, and soon afterward they began in uh, Jim Lovelock's characterization of most rewarding collaboration. Uh, Lovelock's first published introduction to the Gaia hypothesis came in a two-page letter to the editors of Atmospheric Environment in 1972. Um, and Lovelock and Marvelous elaborated the Gaia hypothesis in various publications through the 1970s, most notably in Telus, Icarus, Origins of Life, Coevolution Quarterly, uh, The Sciences, and a little bit more technically in Pure and Applied Geophysics. Gaia, New Look at Life on Earth by Lovelock appeared in 1979, the same year, once again, that Some Fundamentals of Conservation by South, uh, in Southwest by Leopold appeared in environmental ethics. Um, in formally introducing the Gaia hypothesis for the first time, Lovelock simply personifies the biosphere with the name Gaia. I think that this is important, that basically Gaia is just the biosphere by another name, at least in, in Lovelock's initial uh, presentation of it. Uh, at that time, Lovelock was ignorant of Vernadsky's work, but cites a technical paper on the chemistry of the atmosphere by Hutchinson, which was influenced by uh, Hutchinson's relationship with Vernadsky, uh, whose thought had been profoundly yes, influenced by Vernadsky. So Vernadsky's biosphere becomes Hutchinson's biosphere, becomes for Lovelock the biosphere Gaia, and then in the hands of the uh, collaboration between Lovelock and Margulis, it becomes the Gaia hypothesis. Uh, I, the new name captured the imagination of the segment of the public craving an alternative naturalistic spirituality. But by the same token, it alienated scientists. 
especially those insecure in their own scientific identity and credibility, but not among them was Lynn Marcus. She didn't shy away from the spirituality uh, that uh, tainted the concept uh, in the New Age uh, uh, context. Um, Lovelock noted in Gaia that some passages may be read as if infected with the twin blights of anthropomorphism and teleology. Direct quote. But such were just shorthand to avoid excessive circumlocution. Nevertheless, the Gaia hypothesis as set forth in Gaia was ridiculed in the scientific community for attributing conscious agency to Gaia, uh, whom Lovelock sometimes seemed to employ as a deus ex machina, regular work for Greek gods and goddesses after all, uh, in regulating Earth's temperature, pH, atmospheric chemistry, uh, uh, etc. Ironically, well, two critics stand out. One was uh, Herb Borman, a uh, colleague of Hutchinson's at Yale, who wrote a, a not so complimentary, it was civil, but a not very you know, critical review of Gaia. Uh, and the other was Richard uh, Dawkins. I mean, there are many uh, uh, criticisms of it. Uh, but I think in Dawkins' case, it was particularly ironic. Uh, the author of The Selfish Gene, how more anthropomorphic and teleological can you get than that? And by the way, I, in the book that I'm sort of developing on this uh, subject, um, I've reviewed uh, the rhetoric of uh, George C. Williams, uh, who kind of uh, was, I don't know, institutionalized uh, orthodox Dar uh, Darwinian uh, evolutionary concepts, especially arguing against group selection and so on. And you read there about how uh, various organisms have reproductive strategies uh, that they pursue and so forth and so on that uh, it, it's, yeah, I mean, you talk about uh, uh, anthropomorphism and teleology uh, uh, in, in, the, in this area of evolutionary biology is, uh, is ironic indeed. So Lovelock then responded to these criticisms with the Ages of Gaia in 1988, in which he constructed the faux planet Daisy World to provide a simplified, blind, mechanical model for temperature regulation, light-reflected daisies competing with dark-absorbed daisies. One or the other alternatively flourishes light daisies when warming passes a threshold, dark when cooling does, thus providing their planet with an organic uh, thermostat. Uh, I think that there were two waves of the environmental crisis, the, or the popular conception of it. The first one was, of course, in the 1960s. Uh, it was uh, characterized by local and regional issues, oil spilled beaches, a uh, famous one off the coast of Santa Barbara, uh, sent all of the yuppies into a rage and uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, established the first environmental studies program. Uh, urban smog over Los Angeles and Houston. Uh, agricultural chemicals uh, broadcast, uh, which of course were famously um, uh, criticized by uh, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring. Um, uh, in 1963, uh, John F. Kennedy, Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, wrote a work called The Quiet Crisis, which probably gave the phenomenon its name. Um, but the summer, I, I would date the second wave of the environmental crisis really washing over us rather precisely in 1988. It was, uh, uh, the summer was hot and dry, wildfires were raging in Yellowstone, James Hansen testified to Congress that at anthropogenic global warming had arrived, a hole in the ozone had been discovered over Antarctica, and conservation biologists were proclaiming the advent of the sixth mass extinction in Earth's biogeography. 
Uh, and with that, the environmental crisis was recast as a global and planetary phenomenon rather than a collection of local um, issues. Uh, by the way, the, the Society for Conservation Biology was established in 1986, I think, so all of this was sort of coalescing at that point. So in order to understand the linkages and feedbacks, positive as well as negative, of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere, a correspondingly global planetary science was required. So by the end of the century, there was renewed scientific interest in the Gaia hypothesis, uh, which then became Gaia theory, and even more respectably, uh, respectably Earth's, uh, Earth system sciences. So um, there was a bit of a philosophical schism between uh, James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis um, regarding the Gaia hypothesis. On at least one point of interpretation, uh, Margulis differs emphatically with Lovelock. Uh, according to Lovelock, quote, the entire range of living matter on Earth, interestingly, he uses Vernetsky's preferred uh, term, from whales to viruses and from oaks to algae could be regarded as constituting a single living entity capable of manipulating the Earth's atmosphere to suit its overall needs and endowed with faculties and powers far beyond those of its constituent parts. According to Lynn Margulis, I reject Jim's statement, the Earth is alive. I do not agree with the formulation that says Gaia is an organism rather Gaia is an extremely complex system with identifiable regulatory properties which are very specific to the lower atmosphere. So, then why don't you tell us what you really think uh, here? <laughs> it's pretty emphatic in the uh, disagreement. Uh, in uh, the ages of Gaia, uh, Lovelock expresses admiration for Gene Odom, who who he claims alone among ecologists took a physiological view of ecosystems. That is simply not true. Uh, Odom, certainly it's true of Odom, but he revived the physiological view of ecosystems dominating early 20th century ecology in the heyday of the superorganism paradigm championed by ecology's first dean, uh, Frederick Clements. By 1988, the rival individualistic paradigm championed by H.A. Gleason had triumphed, and ecosystems were no longer represented as superorganisms. So I think that there may be a sort of generational thing here between um, Lovelock and Margulis. Uh, Lovelock was still thinking ecologically back in the Odom era, whereas Margulis was much more of a bioecologist than Lovelock and thus rejected his version of the superorganism, which was in step with her peers. And I think that this is revealing less a single entity than a huge set of interacting ecosystems. The Earth as Gaian regulatory physiology transcends all individual organisms. Gaia is the series of interacting ecosystems that compose a single huge ecosystem at Earth's surface, period. Gaia is the sum of these growing, interacting, dying populations of multi-species planetary covering composed of myriad very different beings. Gaia is the largest ecosystem on Earth. So the difference here is between a single organism which was consistent with Clemensian Odomesque ecology whereas Marvelous is emphasizing that it is not a single organism, but rather what we might call the ecosystem of ecosystems conceived in more contemporary uh, 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 Gleasonian as opposed to Clemensian terms. Uh, so I'm just sort of developing Jim's idea, playing with Jim's idea of the ages of uh, the biosphere from Vernadsky to Mar Margulis. So just to sort of get the big overview here. Vernadsky's biosphere is principally metabolic, transforming radiant solar energy into potential chemical energy, inert into living matter, living matter into biogenic inert matter, 
the face of the lithosphere and the chemical composition of the atmosphere, the hydrosphere. Leopold's living Earth also has a metabolism that's unelaborated, but also a physiology, organs with functions. Hutchinson's biosphere is also both metabolic and physiological, but with an ecosystem emphasis on energy flows and material cycling. Lovelock's Gaia is primarily physiological, but with an emphasis on cybernetic functions. Marvelous's Gaia combines Vernadsky's metabolic with Lovelock's cybernetic emphasis while rejecting Lovelock's superorganism uh, uh, idea. So what about the noosphere uh, from Teilhard to Mar Marvelous? Teilhard's noosphere is the teleological and theological evolutionary liberation of mind from matter. Leopold's noosphere is probably an emergent consciousness analogous to our own and no more self-designing than our own. Vernadsky's noosphere is the wired network of human brains sharing a common epistemology, the scientific method, the collective body of knowledge, science, uh, applied via technology to the age-old projects of life. It's just doing what life or living matter has always done, which is to transform inert matter into itself and create uh, biogenic uh, minerals. Um, Lovelock's noosphere was apparently the divine goddess Gaia, uh, teleologically designing her own body and consciously regulating it. Uh, Marvelous's uh, noosphere is the proprioceptive sensibility of the great ecosystem analogous to the unawares processing of spatial orientation and motion. Now I'm going to elaborate a little bit on both Lovelock and Marvelous where, uh, where these ideas are concerned. Um, as opposed to his apparent, Lovelock's actual cy cybernetic uh, Noosphere. All cybernetic systems, he writes, simple oven thermostats included, are intelligent to the extent that they must give the correct answer to at least one question. If Gaia exists, then she is without doubt intelligent in this limited sense at least. A warm-blooded organism's automatic temperature regulating system is intelligent to the point of genius by comparison with a thermostat in the oven, but it is still below the level of consciousness, below the level of consciousness. It is to be compared in intelligence with the level of the regulatory mechanisms which we would expect to find Gaia using. So Lovelock is basically sort of expanding the idea of intelligence and uh, therefore t t taking the personality and, and, and directive power away from uh, uh, Gaia's uh, uh, consciousness or subconsciousness. Lovelock goes further. If we are a part of Gaia, it becomes interesting to ask, to what extent is our collective intelligence also a part of Gaia? Do we as a species constitute a Gaian nervous system and a brain which can consciously anticipate environmental changes, as, which would be pretty much what uh, uh, Vernetsky thought. <coughs> and this was written before Lovelock was aware of Vernetsky's work. So what about Marvelous's proprioceptive noosphere? Quote, analogous to proprioception, Gaia patterns appear to be planned but occur in the absence of any central head or brain. Proprioception as self-awareness evolved long before animals evolved and long before their brains did. Sensitivity, awareness, and responses of plants, protocysts, fungi, bacteria, and animals, each in its local environment, constitute the repeating pattern that ultimately underlies global sensitivity and the response of Gaia herself. Now, consistent with her more Neo-Gleasonian ecological understanding of Gaia, Marvelous is loath to think that there is a unified planetary soul or consciousness because there is no single planetary organism to which it belongs. Rather, the billions upon billions of contemporaneous proprioceptive organisms in repeating the same proprioceptive pattern 
in the manner of fractal geometry produce the same proprioceptive pattern scaled up to planetary proportions. That seems to be the thought that is conveyed here. So what about Gaian ethics, uh, Vernadsky and Leopold? Uh, for Vernadsky, the geological evolutionary process shows the biological unity and equality of all men. It, so it's anthropocentric, and in some sense, it's anticipating the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As I say, uh, in this particular piece on the noosphere was written just as World War I was ending in 1945, and it was very much on his mind as a, as a war involving racism and nationalism and that sort of thing. So he sees the, the ethics of the biosphere as unifying humanity and the corresponding ethic of a unified humanity as a universal declaration of human rights, which follows in 1948. Uh, Leopold, of course, is much more the ethicist and uh, he writes, Ezekiel, he's quoted Ezekiel about dirtying the waters and trampling the soil and so on. And he says, Ezekiel seems to scorn waste, pollution, and unnecessary damage as something unworthy, as something damaging, not only to the waster, but to the self-respect of the craft and the society of which he is a member. So this is anthropocentric, but it's personal, professional, and social virtue ethics, not only the self-respect of the waster, but of the craft and of the society of which he is a part of, in trying to illustrate uh, sort of these more collective dimensions of virtue ethics, uh, one can think that, for example, a society that tolerates uh, slavery uh, is a society that lacks virtue as well as the individual slaveholders, for example. Um, according to uh, Leopold further, the privilege of possessing the earth entails the responsibility of passing it on for our use, better, the better for our use, not only to immediate posterity, but to the unknown future. So this would be both an anthropocentric, but intergenerational ethics. Um, and then finally, Leopold uh, <laughs> offers the following, we cannot destroy the earth with moral impunity because the earth is an organism possessing a certain kind and degree of life, which he sanguinely believed we intuitively respect as such. That would be uh, ethics more in the Kantian uh, mode, uh, and, but also non-anthropocentric in this case, that we're respecting life as such. Uh, the, Lovelock's Gaian ethics evolved. Uh, in 1979, he was critical of the misanthropic and Luddite environmentalism of the uh, 60s and 70s. He regarded Gaia as resilient, and he was a technological uh, optimist, pretty much uh, business as usual, uh, uh, exploitative uh, ethics. In 1988, he caricatures the impression that he himself left in 1979. Lovelock's Gaia gives industry the right to pollute at will. Uh, Gaia, uh, he goes on to say, is neither a doting mother, tolerant of misdemeanors, nor some fragile and delicate damsel in danger from brutal mankind. She is stern and tough, but ruthless in her destruction of those who transgress. By 2006, uh, he writes, be, uh, he has become a climate change alarmist. We have unknowingly declared war on Gaia. The ineluctable forces of Gaia marshal against us. Battle will soon be joined. By the way, this idea was anticipated by um, the uh, one of the intellectual ancestors of Bruno Latour, Michel Serre in Le Contrat Naturel, in which he um, develops the idea that we have declared war on, on uh, I don't think, I think he says Gaia, and uh, we 
we've got to sue for peace, basically. Uh, and so there's some connection here between Lovelock and Michel Serre, uh, though over uh, t two decades. And in 2008, uh, Lovelock writes, it is hubris to think that we know how to save the earth. Our planet looks after ourselves, after itself. All we can do is to try to save ourselves. What about the uh, Gaian ethic of uh, Lynn Marvelous? Uh, we've heard this expression before that Gaia is a tough bitch. How many times today already? Here's the actual quotation, but it gets better. Gaia, a tough bitch, is not threatened by humans at all. No human culture, despite its inventiveness, can kill life on this planet, were it even to try. The notion that we can destroy all life, including bacteria thriving in water tanks of nuclear power plants or boiling hot vents, is ludicrous. Life is fed on disaster and destruction from the beginning. Gaia incorporates the ecologic crises of her components, responds brilliantly, and in her new necessity becomes the mother of invention. Uh, Frank Zappa and the mother of, mothers of invention, that's got to be the illusion. To me, the human move to take responsibility for the living earth, such as Leopold was urging, is laughable. The rhetoric of the powerless. The planet takes care of us, not we of it. Our self-inflated moral imperative to guide a wayward earth or heal our sick planet is evidence of our immense capacity for self-delusion. Rather, we need to protect us from ourselves. So Lovelock's latest statement on uh, this agrees with um, Marvelous's uh, statement all along. Uh, so that's the Ages of Gaian Ethics by Calicott. I haven't really quite got that out yet. Uh, but stay tuned for my new book, which is titled From the Alder Leopold Land Ethic to the Earth Ethic, A New Moral Philosophy for a Time of Climate Change. It's currently under review by Oxford University Press. Uh, so thanks for your attention.